ีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ In 2018, I co-founded a company called Eat Lab to help businesses effortlessly embed state-of-the-art AI technology into their day-to-day -day operations. At the core of our technology is our ability to measure customer satisfaction or happiness. And we found something very interesting that I would like to share with you all today. So before we go on and watch some videos that you're about to see, um, a blind study was conducted where two subjects were given um, different plates of food. One was given a delicious meal and the other one was given not so greatly taste food. And so let's see if you can determine which one is which, the man or the woman. So um, let's see the video. And also, while you're watching it, actually question why you think the way that you think. Okay, so uh, what do you guys think? The man or the woman who actually had a delicious meal? And why, why, was, why was it? Um, but when we asked them, we thought that originally, you know, you would be able to ask people, do you like my food? Um, was this tasty? Do you like it? Are you going to buy it? And this is the basis of the whole customer survey business, um, is that we rely on customers to say what they feel about the product. And our AI algorithm actually contradicts that. So when we ask both of these customers, they say that they love their food, um, while knowingly we give in something that's not tasty and the other one that's really good. Um, so what, we, what our AI algorithm found was that the woman had 30 times higher satisfaction score than men. But how did we do that? So let me walk you through some of the framework that I used in quantifying customer satisfaction. So first, we set an assumption, and then we use it to look at um, and make it assumptions about consumers' behaviors. So for example, in this first set of assumptions, we think that uh, consumers say what they like, um, if they like it or not, right? Um, but when we looked at correlation between sales and customer scores, you would think that they should correlate somewhat. But what we found was actually there was no significant correlation, which means that we have invalidated the assumption that we first believed to be true. So in that process, we're discovering something that's true about data. And again, you know, um, the framework that I use, I um, actually came up with it myself, um, exploratory data analysis. First, you actually look at data, and then you start to form assumptions about data. And in that process, you then put those assumptions to test in different environments. So these assumptions, for example, um, I'd be testing you know, an idea that I think people who eat something too spicy will drink a lot of water, right? Um, so that might be something very common you observe. And then you would try that for a different vari variety of spices and different people. And then you would try to see if that is still true or not. So what we found when um, people are eating something too spicy, um, it's very consistent throughout whether or not you have high tolerance for spice or not, um, is actually the food will become scattered around the plate and then you end up, your movement is higher. So something, it, the chili actually kind of makes you, you a bit more jittery than before. Um, and we also found something interesting with sweet. If you drink something that's too sweet, uh, your speed gets infinitely slow, which means that each sip that you take gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Then you never actually finish the drink. Um, so let's say after you find ways to invalidate what you're actually have originally agreed upon and thought of, what you end up finding is actually you found what is true about the data. So uh, let me just quickly um, um, say that about the, quest uh, the questionnaire model. Um, model of customer satisfaction, which we think that we could ask customers what they say and they feel, and that should result in a kind of like the eventual score, the ratings and everything. But the eventual model that we came up with was that 
um, custom, customer ratings are not included in the model. So you revert the assumption that you have invalidated so that you know for sure become the truth. So and this cycle continues on. And as you continue to invalidate yourself, your assumptions, things that you believe to be true, you end up getting closer to truth. These models are constructed this way in our work. And because of it was constructed this way, it's very resilient to different data sets. It's very robust and high, had higher accuracy and precision you know, for a smaller data set. Um, so let me take you guys back about 13 years ago. Let me walk you through some journey of how I actually made a discovery about predictive model of happiness. 13 years ago, my definition of success was to get higher education, was to go on and have a notable career, make enough money to support my mom, my sister, my family, buy a car, buy a house, um, and then I should be happy. I should be all set. All that sounds so great, but what happened was um, when having achieved some of those goals, I, I felt empty. I... I I just realized I wasn't happy. And it contradicts my whole thinking, you know, how I learn in school, you should achieve certain things, and then you get clapped. Um, you, you get certain score, you go to certain school, um, you meet certain expectations of whom, right? And in fact, I actually plunged into depression. Um, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And I really wonder why having all these, these things that define success in my life did not lead me to happiness. And in that darkest moment of my life, I actually came across this book called The Human Revolution by Dr. Daisaku Ikeda. It was a story about how his mentor, who just came out of prison in wartime Japan because he refused to give up his belief for a state religion, determined to make world peace. Um, so when I think about that man, right, he was so malnutrition, lost more than half of his weight, a very tall, robust man, lost more than half of his weight, could barely walk on his own, think about other people. He thinks about how he can make everyone in the world happy. And then I thought, hmm, for a moment, I feel like he's so happy, he's so joyful. He almost went blind because of malnutrition. He couldn't walk, he had lice, he lost so much of his weight. And the school that he built from the ground up collapsed because of the war and all the bombing and stuff. And uh, I just found a way to really invalidate my first assumption that success does not lead to happiness. It's not even correlated with happiness. So I found a way to, to actually find some comfort in knowing that what I knew was wrong. Um, so there was this character, you know, that determined that, um, that wanted to make world peace. And then that got me really thinking. Um, so maybe my model of happiness doesn't comprise of success after all. Let me actually walk you through um, a few more um, assumptions that I've invalidated in my life. You know, again, first one was success does not lead to happiness. Um, I volunteer to listen to a lot of young women talking about her problems. Um, it's part of giving back also to community. I was one of those who actually were listened to um, and realized that how you know, how comforting it is to be able to actually share my suffering and joy with someone. Um, so these women, you know, some of them have been in abusive relationship as I have. Um, you know, some of them were very insecure about, you know, things in their life, uncertain about the future. And then I realized, like, we're all facing the same thing. I used to think that my suffering, you know, how I'm feeling right now, it's something that's only true to me. It's something that I feel no one would understand. Because you haven't been beaten by someone, because you haven't been, you know, so upset about certain things, you don't understand me. I felt that way. But when I listen to other people, there's some elements of it that resonates with my life. 
And when I share how I overcame that struggle, or just the fact that, you know, I'm strong enough to just smile at it and then just go. I don't know how to solve the problem, but I'm just going to walk. I'm just going to go ahead and walking along this path where I believe that eventually I will solve my problem. No one else is going to solve my own problem, but I will. So, again, second assumption, <laughs> invalidated. Suffering is very universal. It's not only mine or mine to feel. Um, the last one, um, you know, as I was sharing about uh, encouraging these women, somehow I feel joy. I, I felt that, um, you know, of course I wasn't not going through anything during that period of time. I was also going through some stuff, you know, there were things that I wanted to achieve in my life, and I haven't achieved that, you know, there's this traction I want to get to, there's this kind of hiring, I want to like do better, you know, there's always like struggle, but I never stop encouraging them. Um, and in that process, especially when you have problems, and then you reach out to other people, your life somehow feels joy. That I did, I did. I, I do, I feel like tremendous hope and power in my life to actually be able to share um, suffering of other people and imparting joy to them. So again, the last um, assumption that I invalidated was that problem does not lead to suffering. So we used to think all along, you know, like if I have problem, I'm going to be upset, you know. But it's really not because of the problem. It's because of you. It's because of ourselves to really feel the lack of ability to solve that problem. So in fact, problems are catalysts. They are ingredients that would help you propel your life. Without them, you will not become strong enough to conquer them and therefore feel that sense of joy and exhilaration at the end of that race. So, um, I just want to leave you with this one last thought, that if you ever feel challenged about the way that you conduct things in your life, um, that things were not going the exact way that you want it to be, just remember you're invalidating your own assumption. You're actually getting closer, one step, one small step, closer to truth. And that is, that is very valuable. So when you feel uncomfortable, when you feel challenged, you must feel happy. You must feel joy because you're so close to that truth to understand a little bit more about your life so that you can actually contribute to other people's lives. So um, I want to end with my um, photo of my daughter, who has been my inspiration. Um, and I really wanted to dedicate this talk to her to inspire her that she could become um, whatever she wants to be, um, whether that, whatever, whatever that future lies in front of her. So I hope that everyone as well can feel that really the strength comes from within. Um, the ability to create happiness is already within you. Thank you very much. <laughs>